silence to keep our law enforcement and our prayers that they come home safe and our military that they come home safe as well. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The notice of this meeting pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act, NJSA 10-4-10, has been complied with and shall be entered into the minutes of this meeting. Roll call. Free Elder Armwood? Free Elder Kenny? Here. Free Elder Koppel? Here. Free Elder Nara? Here. Free Elder Tamara? Here. Free Elder Valenti? Here. Free Elder Director Rios? Here. We have some recognitions and let the record uh, state that Free Elder Armwood is in attendance. Uh, yes. First is to proclaim May as Mental Health, Mental Health Awareness Month in Middlesex County. Next is to proclaim May as Older Americans Month in Middlesex County. Next is the 2017 Community Awards for the Knights of Columbus Council number 257. Next is proclaiming May 1st, 2017 as Workers Memorial Day in Middlesex County. Next is recognizing Amy Mansu for her personal commitment by CASA of Middlesex County at their annual toast on May 7th, 2017. And last is recognizing Eagle Scout Jacob L. Kleinman as he attains Eagle Scout status. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. <coughs> motion by Field Valenti, second by Tamara, roll call. Freelda Armwood? Yes. Freelda Kenny? Yes. Freelda Capo? Yes. Freelda Nara? Yes. Freelda Tamara? Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Yes. Freeholder Director Reyes? Yes. Freeholder Valenti will make the presentation. Good evening. As you well know, uh, May 17th is, uh, 2017 is Mental Health Awareness Month. And it's my great pleasure to announce that tonight we're having an awards and proclamation presentation in honor of Mental Health Awareness Month. We'd like also to call attention to the beautiful poster that the Mental Health Board Planning Committee is over there, <coughs> along with local artists, jointly created a symbol of mental health awareness about stigma and the message of hope and recovery. This year, to honor Mental Health Awareness Month, Middlesex County is recognizing the outstanding advocacy efforts of a Middlesex County leader and agency. We are delighted to announce the following one award recipients. <clears throat> outstanding Middlesex County advocate, Elena Kravitz, CSPNG, Moving Forward Community Wellness Center, an outstanding agency program, Aruna Rao, NAMI's New Jersey Multicultural Mental Health Outreach Program. A word about Elena Kravitz. Uh, she's the paragon of an advocate who works to put an end to mental health stigma. In fact, one would be hard pressed to find a committee or organization in Middlesex County that Elena has not contacted or presented to regarding the powerful work of peers and the message and promise of hope that peer support wellness and recovery holds. Her advocacy and unwavering dedication to ending mental health stigma makes her truly deserving of this award. Thank you, Elena, for all you do. And do we want to give the award first? Yes, we'll oh, okay. give the award first. <coughs> Elena, congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you so much. This is truly so meaningful to me. Um, oh gosh, you know, I came to this county some years ago, and I didn't know anybody at all, really, except my son and his wife. And in these, it seems like very short years, I feel like I know everybody in the county. <laughs> 
and everybody certainly knows me. <laughs> um, and if they don't, they've heard about me and they run the other way. But no, that's not true. Everybody has been so wonderful. I work with an amazing group of people. We have such a friendly, a mental health friendly county. It's, it's an amazing thing because I have lived elsewhere. And um, so I know. Um, I just like to say one thing. Oh, it's actually more than one thing. Um, and I'm stealing it from someone else tonight uh, because it needs to be said. So um, as a gentleman that we know in the peer movement uh, by the name of Harvey Rosenthal has said, we must be very clear that the greatest contribution of our respective movements has been to raise the bar for what is possible for people with behavioral health conditions and what should be expected from our services, our social conditions, and our public policies. Where would people and families be had we not all come forward to do this over the last few decades? So I want to thank everybody that's here, and please spread my thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a word about NAMI in New Jersey, both are cultural and mental health outreach programs. Although there are many agencies doing great work in Middlesex County and throughout New Jersey, this one was selected because of their pioneering programs that reach multiple underserved communities, including African American, Chinese, South Asian, and Latino Americans. Their specialized multicultural groups offer support, education, and advocacy for these diverse communities and help to fight to pervasive, the pervasive stigma that makes recovery more challenging. And congratulations to NAMI New Jersey for this valuable program. Thank you so much. And uh, we're making a presentation, this proclamation, declaring May as Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, on behalf of NAMI New Jersey, I'd like to thank um, uh, the freeholders and, and Middlesex County for um, recognizing our work. Um, it is not easy to be um, someone uh, who's dealing with a serious mental health condition um, and who's either an immigrant or dealing with various um, issues related to race and um, minority status in this um, country and in this county. Um, I feel our programs make a small contribution um, towards making the experience of people with mental illness um, and their families a little easier, a little easier to navigate the very complex systems that we have. And um, there's a lot more to be done, but I feel that with the kind of support that we have over here, uh, we can really go a long way towards making a difference in the lives of those affected by mental illness. Thank you so much for this award. We have a proclamation, I'm not going to read it, it's kind of long, but I will simply say that whereas people with mental illness recover, uh, illnesses recover if given the necessary supports and services in the community, however, only one out of two people with a serious mental illness seeks help due to the stigma and the fear of discrimination. Middlesex County recognizes the stigma associated with mental illness and that many people remain unserved in part because of the stigma of seeking help. This month we call attention to this so we can bring mental illness out of the darkness and encourage treatment and support. We acknowledge that greater public awareness about mental illness can change negative attitudes and behaviors. Middlesex County stands with those impacted uh, by mental health illness and pledges to increase awareness and greater understanding of mental illness, reduce the stigma and discrimination, and promote appropriate accessible support and services. We strive to promote a message of hope 
and the belief that healing and recovery are available. And of course, this is all signed by our freeholder director on behalf of the County of Middlesex, and we do hereby proclaim the month of May 2017 as Mental Health Awareness Month. Thank you. Thank you. And here, the second proclamation is Anne Smalling. Anne Smalling. Take care. Thank you so much. Would you like to take that? Would you like to say a few words? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to thank the freeholders for the opportunity to accept this Mental Health Awareness Month proclamation and for supporting our efforts to combat stigma in Middlesex County. I am truly honored to accept this proclamation on behalf of the Mental Health Board. I would also like to acknowledge that this year's Mental Health Awareness activities have been a collaborative effort and would like to thank Penny, Evelyn, Elena, Ron, Lori, and Jody for their contributions to the Mental Health Awareness Planning Committee. The effects of mental health stigma are absolute and devastating. Managing emotional distress, trauma, and symptoms are difficult. Yet the discrimination, isolation, and shame that mental health stigma engenders prevents individuals from seeking help and inhibits recovery and wellness. As a person who has felt the weight of stigma, I can tell you that I struggled in silence and isolation for many, many years because I didn't want the shame associated with seeking help from a mental health professional. I feared what a label or a diagnosis would mean for my social life, my career, and my future. Tonight, however, I can undoubtedly say that we break ground toward ending discrimination because this proclamation is a fundamental advancement of our commitment to ending mental health stigma in Middlesex County and beyond. This commitment will change perceptions of mental health, will encourage individuals to seek support, and brings a message of hope to all that recovery is possible. With that being said, I'd like to bring attention to the Mental Health Awareness poster and would like to acknowledge the two Middlesex County artists for their contributions to the poster. Thank you, Karen McLeod, for submitting The Faces of Karen, and thank you, Nidhi Joshi, for submitting Hope. Again, many thanks for shedding a positive light on the issue of mental health. Yes, each freeholder has been provided with a list of correspondence received by the clerk's office since our last meeting. This correspondence will be kept on file in the office of the clerk of the board for reference. Is there a motion to accept? So moved. Second. Motion to accept by freeholder Volante, seconded by Field of All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Ordinances. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, the board. No. The first minutes. 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 She has minutes. I'm sorry. Minutes. <laughs> the Board of Chosen Freeholders regular meeting, April 20th, 2017 at 7 p.m. <coughs> motion. Motion. Second. Motion by Freeholder Valente, second by Deputy Director Tamar. Roll call. Freeholder Armwood? Yes. Freeholder Kenny? Yes. Freeholder Capua? Freeholder Nara? Yes. Freeholder Tamaro? Yes. Freeholder Valente? Yes. Freeholder Director Rios? Yes. Ordinances? Clerk will read ordinance number 436 by title only. Reappropriation and amendatory ordinance number 2017-436. Reappropriation and amendatory ordinance providing for various highway and bridge capital improvements, various uh, in engineering capital improvements, and the purchase of county office space to be constructed as a component of the middle of the New Brunswick Cultural Center project by and in the county of Middlesex, state of New Jersey, reappropriating, repurposing 17 million five. $119,377 consisting of reappropriated excess bond proceeds in the amount of $1,396,468 and repurposed unfunded debt proceeds in the amount of $1,396,468 and repurposed unfunded debt authorizations of bonds or notes in the amount of $16,122,909 in existing county bond ordinance to finance the costs thereof and authorizing the public hearing to be held on Thursday, May 18th at 7 o'clock p.m. and publication thereof. Is there a motion to adopt ordinance number 436 by title only? Motion. Motion. Second. By 
Freeholder Valente, second by Freeholder Capo, roll call. Freeholder Armwood? Yes. Freeholder Kenny? Freeholder Capo? Yes. Freeholder Nara? Yes. Freeholder Tamara? Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Yes. Freeholder Director Rios? Yes. Thank you, Freeholder Director. From the Business Development and Education Department, Middlesex County Office of Culture and Heritage, <coughs> folk music programs on Saturday, May 6th at 2 p.m. in the Lodge at Thompson Park, a program exploring the musical traditions of the American folk song, The American Spirit, featuring Matt Polomina. I think I've heard that name before. On Sunday, May 7th at 3 p.m. at the Jewish Community Center on Oak Tree Road in Edison, a lively program entitled Klezmer, traditional Yiddish folk music with the Hester Street Troupe will be presented. On Sunday, May 7th, East Jersey Old Town Village will host a Mother's Day Tea with Alice Paul, an American suffragist. There will be two sessions, one at 1 p.m. and then again at 3 p.m. From the Middlesex County Vocational and Technical High Schools, congratulations to Richard Shire, a veteran teacher in the Electrical Apprentice Program, who was named Instructor of the Year for the United States and Canada by the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. The third annual Real Film Festival, featuring more than 60 works by students from freshmen to seniors, will take place May 4th and May 5th in the auditorium of the East Brunswick campus. Films, video, photography, and audio presentations by 46 digital film students in the MCVTS School of the Arts will be featured. Diners can enjoy a buffet dinner prepared by the students and participate in a professionally rendered thriller when the Piscataway campus of the Middlesex County Vocational and Technical Schools presents its first murder mystery dinner. It is scheduled for Friday, May 19th, and will be held at the North Stelton Volunteer Fire Company. The cost is $45, and the program will benefit the school's Skills USA team. From the Middlesex County Office of Workforce Development, over 500 job seekers attended recruitment yesterday in Perth Amboy to apply for positions with Target. The retailer is opening a distribution center in the city, which will eventually employ 2,500 people. 40 people were immediately offered positions for the initial startup of the facility. A special thanks to the staff of the Office of Workforce Development, who assisted with the recruitment, working in tandem with Target and the city of Perth Amboy. Additional recruitments will be held this summer. Just a reminder for Middlesex County residents who are unemployed or underemployed, text the word WORKFORCE to hashtag 56512 to receive messages from the Office of Workforce Development about employer recruitments and job fairs. Residents are also encouraged to visit our comprehensive career one-stop centers. One is located in New Brunswick at 550 Jersey Avenue, and the other is located in Perth Bay at 161 New Brunswick Avenue. And that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Fielder Director. Thank you, Fielder Director. Thank you, Director. On Saturday, um, April 22nd, we had a uh, beach sweep uh, clean up, uh, clean ocean action at the Raritan Bay Waterfront Park. And um, this was coordinated through Eric Gehrig, if I said his name correctly. I want to thank him. I want to thank Deanna Miller. I want to thank Melissa Johnson and Griffith Boyd for all the work that they did putting this together. Um, even though the weather was a little overcast, 156 volunteers arrived to start the first of the uh, biannual uh, beach sweeps. The volunteers collected seven yards of litter garbage and debris from the shoreline of Raritan Bay, approximately 2,000 pounds. Uh, we also want to send a special thanks out to the Saraville War Memorial High School Environmental Club, Middlesex County College, South Amway YMCA, BJ's Club 172 in Old Bridge, East Brunswick High School Save Club, Edison Metro Leos and Lions Club, the East Brunswick Youth uh, Council, Cub Scout Pack 101, Scout Troop 17, Stephen Institute of Technology, Kappa Sigma, and um, the Sierra Club. Uh, it, was, it was a little, like they said, overcast out that day, but it was a, a wonderful event. A lot of people turned up, great attitudes out there, even though it was cloudy, to help uh, clean up our shores. The second volunteer event will be held at Ireland Brook Conservation Area in East Brunswick Township. It's International M Migratory uh, Bird Day, and it'll be from 9.30 to a.m. till 12 p.m., and that is on May 13th. 
and uh, volunteers will help improve the habitat for the birds and other wildlife through several different projects. A 7.30 a.m. bird hike will precede the, the event. Um, RSVP is highly requested for this event, and they can reach out um, through our county website to uh, the Parks Department. Um, we are now accepting applications for the Summer Conservation Corps, and the deadline for the applications is May 19th. Uh, work will be from June 26th through August 18th, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., and you must be 16 years old to start work. So if you're looking for something to do this summer, we have the uh, Summer Conservation Corps uh, is looking for people. The Office of Parks and Recreation has been uh, receiving high volumes of applications for our program Kids in the Park and Teens in the Park, which takes place in Warren Park. Um, so if you want to, there's more information at our county um, website, or you can give Jackie Neal a call at 732-745-3936. Uh, our public uh, family roller skating rink has opened uh, as of April 29th and will run until June 11th. For session times and weather conditions, please contact 732-745-4484. Um, it's a great outdoor skating rink for uh, the family if you want to go out for a day, a couple hours. It's a great place to go, beautiful park, Roosevelt Park. And um, we can also go to our county website if you're looking for uh, more information. And not just Roosevelt Park, but all our parks are open uh, and operating. And so if you want to, on a, on a day, a beautiful weather day, not tomorrow because it's supposed to be very rainy, unless you like the rain, um, go out and visit our parks. Go out and take some time, get out there and enjoy and see what we have to offer here in Middlesex County. Um, all the parks are in prime condition, so please enjoy. And the last part of my report is Public Works. Um, as part of a shared service agreement that the Office of Public Works is, uh, has with various towns throughout the county, we're milling and paving sections of Crescent Avenue, Snow Hill Street, and Heffron Drive, uh, municipal roads in East Brunswick and Spotswood. Uh, this collaboration results in um, savings for the towns. They, they pay for the cost, but they get it cheaper by using the county services to uh, have the work done. So that's just some of the ongoing projects that we have in Public Works, and um, I believe that's all. Director, thank you. Thank you, Fielder Kenny. Fielder Leslie Koppel. Well, thank you, Fielder Director. We have an introduction of ordinance this evening, 436. Each year as part of our capital budgeting process, we continue... We continue our efforts to maximize capital dollars by closing out completed projects which came in under budgeted estimates. These capital surplus <coughs> balances are commingled and repurposed using the reappropriation process in order to fund such projects as resurfacing and other improvements on county roads, rehabilitation, replacement and improvement of county bridges, and improvements to various county intersections. Repurposing old debt avoids or cancels out issuing new debt, which results in reducing the overall county's debt as well as reducing debt service. And moreover, will ensure the continued AAA bond rating, which we have maintained for the past 12 years. In addition, we've had a kickoff of an upgrade of the financial system. On April 19th, the Finance Department participated in a kickoff meeting for the implementation of an upgrade to the county's 20-year-old financial system. This upgrade will bring us to the newest state-of-the-art technology, will automate many of the current processes resulting in the elimination of paper transactions, increase productivity and efficiency, the new system will also improve daily operation and allow for enhanced fiscal management. We are planning to have an aggressive rollout of the system for a January 1st, 2018 go-live date. And that concludes my report, Director. Thank you, Phil the Copper. Phil Narrow. Thank you, Director. Um, last week, the county's Department of Public Safety and Health participated in a national exercise entitled Gotham Shield. This uh, exercise simulated an improvised nuclear device being detonated on the New York-New Jersey border. The drill included mock videos, injects of the original scenario, population monitoring, and decontamination. 
Um, I have audiovisual. This drill tested all aspects of the county's emergency response efforts and provided additional training to the staff on the use of specialized equipment. As a component of this training exercise, the county's hospitals also participated in practicing large-scale mass decontamination of those affected by the improvised explosion. Participants of the exercise included numerous agencies on the federal and state uh, government level, county and municipal agencies, as well as our private sector partners. The evaluator's initial critique of the county's response provided the department with high marks and praised the organized, coordinated, and systematic response to all of the scenarios presented. I would like to thank all of those who participated in the event and especially thank those who volunteered their services that day. From the department's division of solid waste management, there are two more shred events scheduled. Uh, these events are free to all county residents. The first will be held on Friday, May 12th at the Highland Park Senior Center, located at 220 South 6th Avenue from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. And the second one will be Saturday, May 13th, 2017 at the Sayreville Senior Center, 423 Main Street. And again, this event will be from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. If anyone has any questions, please call 732-745-4170 or check out the county website where there will be additional information. And that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Freeholder Mayor. Freeholder Deputy Director Charlie Tamaro. Thank you, Director. Uh, as Freeholder Liaison to the Middlesex County Open Space and Recreation Public Advisory Committee, I'm happy to report that next week the county will close an additional 12 acres of open space in South Brunswick. The purchase is from the estate of William Himble, a longtime resident of Middlesex County. The purchase will expand the county's Ireland Brook Conservation Area, which already encompasses over 500 acres of pristine, pristine forest and provides water quality protection to the Ireland Brook. The new property also will, will continue to support local agriculture, agriculture, an important component to our landscape in the southern Middlesex County. The Board of Elections participated in Middlesex County Superior Court Take Your Child to Work Day on April 27th. The office provided a voting machine program with mock election for the most famous people in American history where the children could actually vote. A Board of Elections re representative gave a talk to the children entitled, Your Count Votes. The event was a big success, and by the way, Abraham Lincoln won, won the election. <laughs> Last year, we started a program with our Plays in the Park, where we invited veterans and their families to spend an evening at the Plays in the Park. Um, the, first, the, the play was South Pacific. The first play was uh, the World War II veterans and Korean War veterans. The second night was uh, Vietnam veterans, and the third night was all other veterans. Over 250 veterans and their families spent an evening with us at the, at the Plays in the Park at no cost. This year we expanded uh, the three the, the nights at um, the Plays in the Park. The first uh, play will be Legally Bond, and the, the two dates is uh, June 26th and June 27th, which are coming up. And all our starting time is 8 o'clock now. We don't start at 8.30 anymore. We're going to start at 8 o'clock. West Side Story is on July 17th and July 18th, and Mary Poppins will be August 8th and August 8th, uh, I'm sorry, August 7th and August 8th. So veterans and their families are invited to come and spend the night at Plays in the Park at no cost to them. Uh, you have to call Jackie Neal, which will be very busy with phone calls. Her number is 732-745-3936. And that is my report, Director. Thank you. Thank you, Freeholder Director. <clears throat> From the Department of Community Services, Middlesex County is hosting its annual birthday bashes throughout the month of May to recognize Older Americans Month and to celebrate county residents aged 90 and older. Each celebration includes a delicious lunch, live entertainment, and expressions of appreciation for the many contributions made by this great generation. This year's National Older American Month theme is, is quote, age out loud, end of quote, which shines a light on many important trends which face our older residents, such as taking charge striving for wellness, focusing on independence, and advocating for themselves as well as others. Our first 90s plus bash was held this past Tuesday at the Edison Senior Center it was a big success with 73 people celebrating their birthday milestone along with their guests. 
The remaining celebrations will be held in South Brunswick, Piscataway, and Old Bridge. And from our Office of Human Services. Each year, the Board of Chosen Freeholders allocates nearly $1 million as support grants to community nonprofit agencies providing social services to Middlesex County residents. This year, we are pleased to provide funding for 53 programs from 29 agencies. All programs meet one of five priorities, promoting economic well-being and self-sufficiency, meeting basic needs and housing, coordinating educational opportunities, improving access to health care and community safety. The Human Services Advisory Council members and staff assist in reviewing proposals and providing funding recommendations. The application cycle for 2018 Freeholder Support Grants will begin in July. And that's the end of my report, Freeholder Director. Thank you, Freeholder Valente. Okay, Mr. Kelso, any resolutions to be added? There are none. Any resolutions to be amended? There are none. Any resolutions to be held? There are none. Any resolutions to be voided? There are none. This time I'd like to open up the meeting to the public on any discussion on any le resolutions listed. Please state your name for the record. You have five minutes and your address. Good evening, Freeholders. Charles Cradiville. I'm from New Brunswick. I'm the editor of New Brunswick Today. And there's only really one item on your consent agenda I wanted to ask about. It's on page four of my copy here, number 699 at the bottom. It's a water treatment services contract, I guess, an extension of a contract. Can you please identify which company or, or you know, which bidder is, is providing these services? And um, you can tell me a little bit about you know, why you need those services and um, the uh, company's uh, you know, track record and qualifications. I'll defer that to my purchasing agent, Ann. Um, Sorry. Thank you. I'm just curious. I'm uh, learning a lot about water. Uh, I want to know, um, you know, what type is there a treatment plant on site? Is that what this is, or is there uh, some service? Is this a round-the-clock thing? No, it's just they, they come in per periodically, and um, I think it's changing filters and things like that. But it's, it's not. It's only a, a three thousand dollar contract for a year for three different sites. I see, and and I'm just curious. The vendor, I'm sorry, the vendor is the Metro Group. Out of Long Metro Group, Long Island City. Okay, and do you do you know if there were other bids when it was bid originally? Um, I do not know. I don't have that information here. I just know that um, it was publicly bid. They were the, the lowest responsible bidder, and they were the ones that were options for um, <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. I'll look into it. Anyone else? I move to close the public. Second. Motion to close by Deputy Director Tamaro. Seconded by Freeholder Valente. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, Mr. Kelso. Uh, just to uh, be so, certain. Is there any, any freeholders that have to vote on any uh, separate? No? No. Okay. Yes, Freeholder Director, uh, then the motion would be in order to adopt the consent agenda consisting of resolution number 17-687 through resolution 17-753. Is there a motion? Motion. Second. Motion by Freeholder Valente, seconded by Deputy Director Tamau, or Paul. Freeholder Armwood? Yes. Freeholder yes. Kenny? Freeholder Koppel? Freeholder Nara? Yes. Freeholder Tamara? Yes. Freeholder Valente? Yes. Freeholder Director Reyes? Yes. This time I open up the meeting to the public. Please state your name for the record <coughs> and address, and you have five minutes. Okay. Um, my name is Ellen Witt and I live at 20 South First Avenue in Highland Park. Uh, I'm here to speak in favor of adopting a written 
Middlesex County policy, which will make it clear that the county will not assist, collaborate, or communicate with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, otherwise known as ICE, without, at a minimum, a valid judicial warrant issued by a judge. Uh, I have copies here tonight of a model policy for you to review. And in addition, I have copies of a letter sent from the ACLU of New Jersey several years ago to the members of this body, outlining the legal problems with your current detainer policy and the legal jeopardy that policy places the county in. Now, ICE often requests the Middlesex County to hold people in jail beyond their release date until ICE has time to pick them up, a violation of the Constitution which opens the county to potential lawsuits. In the past, all of these detainer requests were being routinely honored, something which amounted to holding people without charge for days or a week or more for the convenience of ICE. And these holes led to the deportation of many people who had lived here peacefully with their families for years. To your credit, you adopted a policy in July 2014 that did eliminate, at least on paper, the detention of people on behalf of ICE who had low-level offenses. Unfortunately, even this 2014 policy, now in effect, has some serious problems that allow for detaining some people without a judicial warrant. And the policy that you did adopt has been inconsistently followed by jail staff. In addition, there are no policies, to my knowledge, in place on how the county should respond to other requests, other kinds of requests to, for assistance from ICE, or to strictly limit notification and collaboration with ICE. Uh, this is why we want to propose that you adopt this model, uh, comprehensive, fair, and welcoming policy. It was put together by the New Jersey Alliance for Immigrant Justice and the ACLU of New Jersey. It is a written, it is written to protect people's constitutional rights, particularly Fourth Amendment rights, which guarantee protection from unreasonable search and seizure. It is also written to prevent the county from inadvertently assisting with deportation proceedings, a task that is clearly not a county responsibility. It was carefully written to ensure that if counties in New Jersey followed the policy, they would not be in violation of any federal or state law or uh, directives from the New Jersey Attorney General. And if it is followed, it would address the liability issues facing Middlesex County for your current policy and save money from potential lawsuits. It would save the county money from housing people at the county jail for days uh, without, uh, for days while ICE arranges, is, uh, arranges a convenient pickup. And if proper training takes place, it would make it clear to all personnel how to respond to ICE, thereby decreasing pressure on staff to figure out what to do with ICE requests. This policy amounts to a lot of free legal work, uh, so why not take advantage of it? Uh, essentially, Middlesex County should not be involved in the immigration enforcement business. It is not obligated to and should not provide time, resources, personnel, or facilities to assist ICE. Given the rise in ICE detentions in the area, in particular in New Brunswick recently, the pressure ICE puts on the county jail, and the recent ICE arrest of an immigrant inside a Middlesex County, the Middlesex County courtroom, uh, it is critical that you take the lead now to not only establish clear policies that are understood and followed by all staff, but also that you take a public position to condemn ICE for actions in the courthouse, actions that violate the integrity of the judicial system as an institution itself. ICE arrests inside the county courthouse intimidate both witnesses and defendants, and therefore also violate the rights of people in the courthouse. I would like to know what the freeholders, where the freeholders stand on these issues. That's time. Okay. 
Uh, first, let me say this. We are not working in collaboration with ICE as far as doing their job. We will not assist them. We have not assisted them in uh, arresting or handing over people that they deem uh, to uh, deport, okay? Uh, we will not... You hold them. You hold them. You, you have held them for them. If someone is under arrest and they are awaiting trial, we will have them. Well, once, they are once they are up to be released, they will be released. And when they will not be released, we will not hold them for 48 hours if ICE is asking us to hold them uh, unless... It, we, if they get a warrant, if we get a warrant, okay, we will, it only will be honored if it's signed by a judge. Okay, that's not in your current policy that you passed in 2014. Uh, let, let me try to clarify for you if I can, and I think Freehold and Arrow will also want to respond to it. The policy has been revised based upon current circumstances. Obviously, 2014 was a different world, if you will, with regard to this issue in the public's mind. Uh, and the, the county has revised its policy. And, and I, I had the opportunity to review the information that was provided. And it's interesting because I think our policy almost mirrors all the 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 issues associated with were brought up in your materials save for a couple but with regard to the detainer policy first let me clarify it the the county's position is that it does not honor 48 hour detainer requests by ice except under two circumstances the first is if the individual was previously convicted of a either a, a first or second degree offense, which is a serious offense, uh, either in New Jersey or, or elsewhere, and is currently being held by the jail uh, for whatever whatever charge there may be. It could be a minor offense, it could be a major offense. But it's only under that circumstance uh, that they would honor a detainer request. Or, so without a d judicial warrant in that first case. Or if there is a second uh, a second circumstance could be if a, an individual was the subject of a prior judicial order of deportation, not ICE's order of deportation, but a judicial order of deportation. Under those circumstances, the county would honor a 48-hour detainer. So the general so the first is case is not a judicial warrant from ICE at the time that you're holding them for the 48 hours. That's your own option. The, yes. Well, the option is if, if they've been convicted not charged, but convicted of a first or second degree offense under those circumstances, then we would honor, simply honor a 48 hour detainer request. The issue so that that's without a judicial warrant from ICE. I, I'm just clarifying that yeah, because yes. you're expanding the number of cases. So it's under those cases which were in the previous policy, plus now if they have a judicial warrant. If there is a d judicial warrant of deportation. Correct. Of deportation. So right. you've now expanded. Okay. Right. That's an expansion, I think. Before you just had... No, no. The, actually, um, it, it you actually had some additional ones as well. People hadn't even been convicted you were holding, so... Right. Correct. So it's really a reduction. In this case, it's only if someone's been previously convicted or been an order of, uh, subject to an order of deportation. We've also modified the policy to take into consideration what ICE has currently done, which is to now issue what they refer to as warrants of arrest or warrants of removal of deportation, uh, which was not what they previously had done. They were previously referring to only detainer requests. Our position on those are they are civil warrants. Mm -hmm. They are not judicial warrants. That's right. And the county will not honor a warrant of deportation or removal or a warrant of arrest issued by ICE unless it's accompanied by a signed judicial order by a federal judge or a magistrate. So those warrants of removal, warrants of arrest, are not being honored. We've also specifically established in the policy that the county is not entering into, nor will enter into, any 287G agreements, which I know is one of the th concerns that was raised. Uh, and the, the county's policy also holds true, and I know we really focus on the Adult Correction Center, but we raised the issue with the courthouse, that this policy extends throughout all county facilities or county individuals, the Sheriff's Department, Adult Corrections. Uh, and as you know, this, the Chief Justice of the, Supreme, uh, of, the, of the New Jersey Supreme Court has, has requested, and, and I'm sure there'll be more on this, as to 
asking ICE to not I interfere with the judicial process, if you will, by coming into the courthouses. As you know, the Sheriff's Department is responsible to maintain security in the, sh in the courthouse and the courtrooms and, and to provide order and security for the judges and jurors and, and any uh, members of the public that are there. The county can't stop ICE representatives from coming into the building, but the Sheriff's Department is specifically uh, directed that it does not in any way assist ICE in any of its activities within the courthouse or any courtrooms, but they're there to provide uh, uh, the administration of control and the security. So there could be circumstances where there could be a disturbance that occurred, and the Sheriff's Department has a responsibility to protect the public, but is not in any way uh, responsible for assisting, and nor will it assist ICE in its, in its activities that go into the courthouse. Hopefully, the Chief Justice will be able to move ICE away from that and take that, that volatile situation away from the Sheriff's Department. <laughs> Uh, officers that are in the building, but our policy is very clear. They will not assist in any of those activities. Uh, they will not uh, in any way assist uh, an, an ICE representative if someone is in our custody, because you could have a circumstance in, in, the, in the courthouse where someone is there that isn't within the custody of the Sheriff's Department. They're there for a civil case. And so they're not in the custody of, of, of the county. But you could also have someone there who is in the custody of the county being held in lieu of bail. And in that case, so that there's no gray area here, the, the county will not permit the turnover of that individual out of its custody based upon anything other than a judicial warrant of arrest. Okay, that sounds good. So, Mike, um, follow up to a couple of questions. One, whether we could get a copy of this new policy. Um, secondly, whether uh, there's any restriction on people from the jail or other personnel from notifying ICE prior to releasing someone to let them know someone's going to go, or uh, restrictions on ICE's access to talking to people inside the jail without notifying people of their rights and who they're talking to. The, the Adult Correction Center is, is instructed not to notify ICE of, of a pending release of an individual. That's specifically okay. part of the directive. Okay. Um, but not necessarily restricting ICE's movement in the jail. Well, that, I'm, I'm sorry, Friel, did you? I know Friel and Arrow would like to speak to that. Um, Ellen, part of, part of the very clear instructions that we've given is, is that um, ICE is is not to be allowed into any secure parts of the facility without a judicial warrant of arrest or mm -hmm. removal. So in those circumstances, that person, we're going to be complying with state and federal law. They, if they have a judicial warrant of arrest or removal, that person has to be released into their custody. But we are not, we have indicated, and um, Warden Cranston is aware of this, and everybody is cooperating. We are not allowing ICE, the ICE agents aren't going to be just allowed to walk into the correctional facility, be buzzed into secure areas, and go into the units and interact with inmates who are being held in our facility. So, um, to your point of, well, are they going to be able to go and interview individuals and gather data? No, because that's part of our commitment that we are not aiding in any sort of, you know, um, actions, immigration actions of ICE. That is their responsibility to deal with outside of our facilities. And um, to your point about expanding the 2014 um, policy now that this new one is. I just want to point out um, the 2014 policy um, was well meant, but had some loopholes. You know, as a lawyer, uh, Mr. Kelso and I, he and I spoke about these things, and there are pieces that were eliminated. Uh, for example, somebody could be arrested on a very minor offense, right, such as driving with a suspended license, and if ICE indicated for some reason that they had a gang affiliation, that would be sufficient to honor a 48-hour detainer. That is not the case anymore. We took out the category um, um, because we're all aware that that is a very amorphous designation, that there's a lot of issues about how does any um, enforcement agency determine someone is gang-affiliated. 
and without a judge, a judicial um, finding that that's the case or someone being convicted of that because there is actually in our policy, one of the first and second degree offenses is someone could be convicted in a court of law of a gang affiliated offense. And in the absence of that, we are not going to honor a ICE determination that someone is. We also took out the language where someone could be charged rather than convicted. So there are ways we've tightened this up quite a bit. And so the I first and second degree um, offenses that you still would hold, that includes offenses that go back years? Yes. Yes. Um, because... Yes, because those are um, first, and degree, first and second degree offenses under the New Jersey Penal Code um, are crimes of, of violence, and um, those are... I believe certain uh, drug distribution charges well, no, are No, I, I know. I'm going to... I'm going to... Um, they are of two kinds, crimes of violence, certain high-level drug offenses, right? And there's one high-level larceny charge, which is in excess of $75,000 or more, but also there's a component of that involving uh, uh, whether the property is drugs. Those crimes... Or under federal law, those are deportable offenses. Those are not someone convicted of those. It's not a question of does that, you know, those go beyond just crimes of moral turpitude. Those are specifically allocated as crimes that will cause you to be deported. Um, so we have, in consultation with a lot of the actors involved here, including law enforcement, including our prosecutor's office and everyone else, we made the determination that if someone was convicted of a first or second degree offense in these categories, and that's in the policy, that we would honor in those circumstances a 48-hour detainer. Um, but certainly that's a conviction. It's not pending charges. If someone has an open case in Texas for something where they're charged of for a, a crime that could be determined to be a first or second degree offense under our penal code, that would not fit under this policy. And what are the number of years? Excuse me, but in all fairness, your five minutes is up. If you have any further questions, you can see or speak to Freeholder now at another time. There's other people here that I would like to speak, and we have a five minute rule. Okay. But, well, I'm going to leave this, um, these policies here just to make sure, since I brought them for you, to make sure that you actually have them in your hands. I would like to get a copy of that policy that you say you've revised. Is there a means for me to get it, or do I have we, to open it? We can get it to you. I guess, Tom? Yeah. Your information. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Freeholder director, can I just ask? May I just ask, I, I just want to clarify, Ellen, you've given us the um, fair and welcoming resolution, but did you give us the letter also? And the letter, Okay, yes, thank you. ACLU. Okay. Anyone else in the public? Teresa Vivar, Lazos America Unida Organization, Mexico Organization in New Brunswick. Um, thank you. I hear the, 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 the comments about the prior exposure today and yes we know we read the policies the circumstances is that people has been detained and the jail somehow immediately I know about these uh, non-criminal charges just tickets or, or because they they even pay the 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 that with a license or what small things minor things but the people has been detained and deported and some of them don't even, even have uh, the opportunity to speak with the wives or the lawyers. And it happens here in the Route 130. Um, here with me is Rossi. His husband has been given uh, the two, cha two, two, two options. One was be detained yesterday after they finished the court hearing. Uh, for driving uh, without license, I think it was. They didn't have the, the um, uh, he didn't have the insurance. He was detained outside of his house, and he was given tickets because he didn't have the insurance card and driving without a license, etc., etc. Many tickets. So he was sent for 10 days by the judge to the to the detention center, to Middlesex uh, County Jail, and uh, so he has either the, to be detained there or be uh, represent himself. 
today at 9 a.m. at the jail. So he went today, he's detained there for 10 days, supposedly, but we have the experience already with other cases that he is not gonna be released after the 10 days, he's gonna be taken by ICE. So how we can help them? He has a kid that needs uh, his support, he has his paralysis, paralysis brain, brain, um, He's, he, he is brain uh, illness, something, and he needs uh, the support of his father. So with everything that happens in the last weeks and the tensions and, 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 and I saying publicly, this is gang affiliated people. But honestly, they, they, they don't have criminal records at all. They don't have gang affiliations. And, and, and how we want to stop them? those situations. All the two people were detained today and they don't have a criminal record either. So how are we gonna cooperate? How is possible that when they put it in the, in the jail, um, they don't able, able to speak with the family members and then they don't have the opportunity to see a lawyer or be released, even they pay the bail bond. We have a, a, at least two cases that I have in contact with that they pay the bail bond, $5,000 and they only pay $10,000 and even they pay the fee, they were given to ICE by the detention center rule authority. Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Grant. So, yeah. uh, the person you were speaking about, did you just say the name? Sergio Moranchel. This morning, case? Yeah. Sergio Moranchel. So I'm, I'm completely aware of the situation. I've read up into the case. I was speaking about it. Please, please help us. And if any way, uh, the only thing that we're asking is that give us the opportunity to find the legal representations they need. Not only be uh, the majority of the people that have been detaining, honestly, they're not criminals. And they, they have minor things, as, as I said, tickets, small things like that. If we can at least somebody from the detention, let us work with you and represent our community members and help them because we have cases like this. English. I have to run at 5 in the morning to support these ladies, to support these males, and, and, and to hear kids screaming. For me, my case, and all the volunteers, is very sad. But it's even sadder that we don't have the opportunity to find the legal representation, not because it's expensive. We don't have, as in, as in New York, a system that's allow people to have the opportunity to either be criminalized or be clear innocent. And I think this county is the, 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 the yeah, example but good and hurt people, good hurt people. And I want you to help us as well. And don't, don't continue eyes of the federal government to criminalize a community that has been given by the numbers. More than 20,000 people, more than that, are living here in our cities and they're contributing every day with their hard labor. And we have cases of this time where they need their support as well. Thank you. Director, just one thing, just one thing. Um, I, I did want to point out, though, what Warden Cranston just said without releasing individual information is um, an example of our exercising our new policy. Because um, if, unless someone has a what we said, a prior first or second degree, or prior judicially, um, a judicially signed order of deportation, our detention center is not going to hold them, no matter what I says. And there was just one issue where I just wanted to address this, where ICE, you know, miraculously finds out. Um, I don't want people here to think that the um, officers and the staff of the detention center are wantonly communicating with ICE. That is not the case. But people do need to understand that once someone is taken into custody and they're fingerprinted, there's an automatic national system. It is not the warden staff picking up a phone or sending an email to ICE. 
ICE will get notified through the national database. Uh, and we can't eliminate that. It just goes out to county, state, and federal. So I just wanted to address that, uh, that concern. And the warden has been doing a very good job talking to his staff. And they are very aware of the policy. And we're trying to do this as humanely as possible for the residents of the county. So. Please state your name and address for the record, and you have five minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, mi nombre es Milagros Sli. My name is Milagros Sli. Eh, soy integrante del Proyecto Esperanza. I'm part of the project, Esperanza Project in New Brunswick. Sí, vivo en la, en la 147 U.S. Kilmer Avenue, New Brunswick. Eh, nosotros en esta noche estamos aquí porque hay mucha duda en nuestra comunidad inmigrante. We're here to... Um, because we don't know what's, what's happening in the community of immigrants. Sobre qué tan protegidos estamos en las cortes y la cárcel del condado de Middlesex. We don't know to what point we're protected um, in the court and um, also in um, Middlesex County. Hemos escuchado de casos de personas arrestadas en la corte superior. We have heard about so many cases in the Superior Court of Middlesex y de personas transferidas de la cárcel de custodios. And also about people being transferred to jail and to the, um, being taken into custody of ICE without any justification. Yes. Sabemos que nadie puede prevenir que ICE haga sus actividades en lugares públicos como en las cortes. We, don't, we know that uh, we cannot prevent it that ICE um, keep doing his other activities in public places like the courts. Pero pedimos que el condado But we're asking to the county haga todo lo posible para no ayudar a ICE en la cárcel y en las cortes. To do everything that is possible to not to help ICE in um, the jails and also to the county. Y pedimos que adopten pólizas um, claras que dicen que solamente colaborarán con ICE. We're also asking to take policies uh, more clear cuando sea necesario bajo la ley and also to only collaborate with them when it's all strictly necessary uh, in order to the law. Well, I think we've expressed our position as far as complying with ICE. And we're not going to do their job. We're not going to, you know, arrest people. We're not going to help them in any way in, in taking into custody anyone that they feel. If they come with an order that's signed by a judge, then we have to turn those over. We have a responsibility to protect all our residents. And we certainly want to protect the county and not being sued for uh, assisting ICE when we shouldn't be. Okay. So Thank I think you. our both our, our, our county council and our, our freeholder NARA made it perfectly clear on our position and our policy of what we how we are moving forward. But as freeholder NARA stated and made it clear that no one in the uh, adult correction facility is calling up ICE and telling them that we're going to release someone. That's not the case. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, good evening, my name is Carolina Moratti. I'm a chef instructor in Elias Promise. I'm also part of the um, Esperanza Mercado project. Um, I'm here um, first to apologize for my aspect. I just came to class, from class. Um, as an as a instructor, I have seen, and I'm very, very familiar with the problems that are happening in here. I have a couple of cases of my students telling me that we have eyes coming to the house looking for somebody else. That's why we cannot come to your class anymore. It has been, um, it has been uh, some misinformation about the people. Uh, social media is putting pictures. P people are staying here and this and that. So that will be my, um, my request tonight to be able to give, to give the people, to give the uh, people the information that they need so they don't get into panic and they don't uh, start going crazy and start trying to figure it out what is going on. Because if they saw police in, in, in New Brunswick, immediately they're going to jump into our conclusions. Oh, ICE was taking people here. They're on this street. Don't go there. Don't drive there. So people don't even want to leave the houses to this point. Oh, my, only, my only request, like I say, will be like giving more information 
try to um, maybe find a way to just give the information and assure that um, if people is putting something on, on, I know it's very difficult with social media, but maybe through the page of the city, try to put out and give information so people can feel more safe. That will be it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, I'm Brian Lee from down the road in Somerset. And uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Board of Freeholders for signing on as interveners in the gas compressor they want to build there. Thank you guys so much. And uh, I, I want to ask, did you guys pass a resolution to against the gas compressor or not? We couldn't find it on. Did we pass a resolution? No. Okay. Okay, I also have a couple of other questions. Uh, my first question is, do you guys, have you guys created a committee uh, specifically re regarding immigration and refugee issues? We have not re uh, created a committee for immigration oh, okay. issues. I would, um, I was, uh, earlier to this week, I was in Highland Park when they passed a resolution to do just that, and I think that is not just a good idea but an extremely necessary one in this uh in this particular time because as you guys are being bombarded with requests and stories you very well know that the situation on the ground keeps changing and uh it would be good to have a committee of people uh from both the board uh community leaders that have the ears to the ground people from the directly affected communities uh, that get to review and go through these issues on a regular basis and make policy recommendations uh, to this board. That would uh, go a long way in ensuring that the, hu hu that the humane protection that uh, your board want wants to extend to people who live here would can continue in a robust way. Well, um, let me say this. We as a board of chosen freeholders, we don't have the authority to legislate law or rules that are governed by cities or towns within the county. No, but, but you do have the power to create committees, right? Oh, uh, yeah, we, sure we, can, we could. I mean, that's uh, what I mean. And as people are brought up here, there are many areas and situations that you guys do have power over. And uh, regarding that, I have a question. Um, with regards to your directives on how to interact with ICE, how is this information disseminated to your average uh, police officer or person working for the police? Does it come out as a directive from the Board of Freeholders or from the police chief? Any, any laws or, or <laughs> statutes or regulations that are dealing with law enforcement, they start out through the attorney's well, let's say federal attorney general, then the state attorney general, and then they get disseminated through the local police departments. But I mean, like specifically your uh, your county regulations on uh, when to hand someone over to ICE, for instance. How is that information told to the uh, to to your everyday uh, police officer? Go ahead, Tom. We our our policy controls what the county controls, which is. It goes to the Adult Correction Center and the staff at the Adult Correction Center through the warden are given the policy, they're given the directives, uh, they go through scenarios so that they know how to handle specific situations. That's at Adult Correction <coughs> Center and, and all the co corrections officers. With regard to the Sheriff's Department, the same policy and uh, recommendations with regard to that policy go to the Sheriff. The Sheriff then disseminates that through the leadership of the Sheriff's Department through all of the Sheriff's officers and there are certain directives and training uh, and understanding of the policy that takes place. Our policies deal with the county. They don't, they don't follow I the go to local police departments no, absolutely. because it's the county's policy. And I want to thank the warden for uh, all the work that I hear you've been doing. Thank you for being so humane on this issue. And uh, again, I do have a, I do have a little speech. I mean, I hear from you guys that you, that your your power might be limited, and uh, freeholders we do depend on you to be cautious and limited, especially when it comes to allocating money and uh, zoning regulations. Caution is good. Caution is necessary. 
But in this particular case, I think when it comes to protecting immigrants from the Trump administration, please don't be cautious, because the need is dire. We are in the midst of a pogrom. I mean, let's call this uh, what it really is. It's uh, birth discrimination. We are talking about something that's a civil offense on par with downloading a pirated MP3. And the ultimate result of that, uh, the from a to be ripped from their families and lives. And it may actually That's go fine. further than that. Uh, we have the, uh, we, under the Obama administration, there have been multiple lawsuits against detention centers for the, the inhumane conditions there. Thank you. Your time is up, sir. Doesn't the question answering time not count against my time? <laughs> Your time is up. Oh, okay. If you have any further questions, you could reach our offices at any time. Call our offices, and we'll get back to you. All right, and I'll just leave you one last thing. Please uh, do more. I mean, I, my apologies to the uh, county council, but, you know, sometimes it's okay to, uh, you know, ignore him. <laughs> <laughs> that happens more than you realize. That's right. <laughs> you don't see it. I'll hear it. <laughs> Can you state your name and address for the record? You have five minutes. Okay. My name is Tracy Cangiano, and uh, my address is 247B South 8th Avenue in Highland Park. And um, I really wanted to just thank you and applaud you for putting together this policy. Um, I might not agree with all of it, it sounds like, but it seems like it's a pretty good policy, and I agree with most of it. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, my question, my number one question is um, implementation of the policy, because that seems to have been the problem even with the 2014 policy. And I heard the warden speak, and I appreciate what you're doing, but he did say he'd look at individual cases. And I'm curious, what does that mean? Because the policy should be pretty clear, and that should trickle down through the staff. How does that happen? Is there anything regarding training in there? Um, you know, how do we ensure that this policy is followed? And so that's my first question. Uh, well, I mean, you should know that the policy in 2014 was uh, recently was, was straightforward. Um, we began to learn over the last couple of months with all the different things that were going on obviously nationally, that and with the uh, input of the field board, that uh, our policy was going to shift. There was a period of time that shifted where it was exactly where it was going to shift. We have a board of the freeholders and the council and the but at the end of the day, the, the policy that is put forth now is what the policy is for the county, and as far as the jail to enforce it, it's, it's straightforward. Uh, we know the policy now. That policy will be put in writing to all the staff members. That policy will be um, enforced, and be, people will be trained on it so they understand the policy. It's, it's not just good to put it out on paper, everyone's supposed to. Sure. You have to train them to really understand it, and they understand the implications of it. At the end of the day, there's a process where if they're not sure, they can fuck it up directly to me. I don't, I don't put too many levels. But everyone in the jail knows the warden is going to weigh in personally on these issues. And if I'm not sure, I defer to county council. So that's sort of that process. Thank you. Do you have a timeline for that? Timeline. A timeline for when the training is going to happen, when it's going to be implemented. Well, uh, <coughs> the policy is fairly new. I can't give you a timeline on the training, but I can tell you that the implementation policy is both well Okay. Two, you know, where I'm going to set. But understand something. No one in the jail will be held for ICE unless I approve it. That's the policy now. Okay. Until my staff understands the full law. Um, and then a, a follow-up question. Um, Previously, I don't believe that there's been any records kept as far as ICE contact and, and issues regarding ICE, um, you know, contacts with the jail. Um, is there anything included in the policy or any steps that you're planning to take to um, record these incidences and, and interactions with ICE to have any records of these? That's not actually built into the policy. The policy is, in, in, it is really just intended to, to identify how we should conduct ourselves. But I think in all cases, in, for example, if anything occurs in the courthouse, the sheriff knows that there is to be a re an incident report identified so that there's a record of, of anything that occurs. And I'm sure that the warden and the staff at the correction center does the same thing. Okay. So there is, there is record keeping that occurs routinely for many incidents, not just ICE incidents in the corrections. There's facility. no centralized record, though, of it. Like, uh, like 
any way that like we could access records or is there any like well, public reporting of no there's no okay. public reporting there's no mandated public reporting and and many in, in these incidents with incident reports you obviously have to look to you know the confidentiality of people information things of that nature but uh, they do keep records for and if for no other reason for our own protection sure um, <laughs> And then, because you just mentioned it, the um, incident at the courthouse on March 31st, um, where someone was detained um, after appearing before a judge, um, I've heard many stories through the many organizations that I work with and such, and uh, there seems to be a lot of conflicting details and, and um, information. Um, do you have a timeline that you've laid out? Like, are you comfortable with the details of that? Um, was the person, did they have a judicial warrant to arrest this person in the courtroom? It, it, again, the as far as the county is concerned, it cannot interfere with what ICE does in the courthouse unless they, two things occur. Number one is if the person they're attempting to take is currently being held in our custody. In that situation, my understanding is that was not the case. They were okay. not being held in our custody. Secondarily, the issue then becomes, is there a need to, to maintain control or security around the incident. That's the only other way a sheriff's officer would be involved. And it's my understanding in that situation, there was interaction because there was a need to make sure that everybody in the courtroom, in the corridors were safe. Thank you, I appreciate That's your time. time. Thank, Thank you. you. Director, if, if I could real quick, I'd just like to uh, commend uh, Freehold and Aaron um, our county council, Tom Kelso, um, our warden, and our director. Um, this has been a, a very tough issue to find a, uh, a balance, um, and it's not been easy. And um, they have worked very hard to turn this policy that we have, to come up with this policy that we have, to try and find that balance. And while it doesn't seem like it here because we're just sitting here for a meeting for a little while, they have worked very hard behind the scenes to find this balance. And I just want to commend them for their efforts on what they've been doing. So, thank you. Please state your name and address for the record. And you have five minutes. Uh, my name is Mina Colta from Matawan, New Jersey. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, my first question is, this year, is it, am I correct to say that a budget was passed for the year for $458 million? Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. How much debt does this county have right now? As of today, how much debt do we have? And how are we planning on paying all that debt? And how, how long is it going to take? How are we planning on paying, and how long is it going to take? Director? Oh, I'm sorry. Could I just, because I was doing, um, we've actually uh, decreased our debt by about $192 million over the last three years. Uh, we were at about $700 million. We're at about $500 million now. Uh, we continue to work um, as best we can to uh, find that uh, perfect level of um, debt where you still maintain the properties that you have and the equipment that you have and the services you provide to the people over a long period of time and take on that debt. And doing that and having a debt policy in place, um, a uh, fund balance policy in place has helped us to um, secure the AAA bond rating that we received for 13 years um, from the uh, bond, agency, bond agency ratings or bond rating agencies. Um, and so we that is something that we have worked on hard over the last three years. I know that our uh, new freeholder, Freeholder Koppel, who's taken over the uh, finance department, um, has jumped in both feet to uh, work hard with um, our financial officer, Joe Peretti, and the rest of our county employees to um, address debt concerns. Okay. Um, my next question is, uh, if you, if we were not to have, if we weren't, if we didn't have any um, raise in property taxes this last year, uh, would ha we have, would we have made less, would the county have made less than previous years? If there was no raise in any property taxes this year, would we have made less than previous years? I'm talking about revenue. So you have a $458 million budget. How much of it are we making in property tax? How much property tax? This year over the year would have been about approximately $10 million on a $460 million budget, or less than 2%. So we're getting, you're saying we're getting, we, we would have lost, or we would have, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't. Huh. Each year for the last 
seven years, our budget has grown by less than 2% a year. Property tax generates the necessary revenues to make investments in capital infrastructures. Maintain that also provides their program and services to the public. In this past year, when we adopted our budget in March, that budget increased by $10 million. That $10 million goes directly to provide those services that are required, as well as the infrastructure and capital improvements we need to continue to make for the safety and, uh, of our residents. And, and some of the areas that we've done that in is um, automating uh, programs. We've reduced the working staff here at the county through attrition. Um, some of those employees weren't replaced because we were able to either consolidate jobs or take it so that uh, it was an automated job. We've also worked hard. I know the um, business administrator and the, and the rest of the freeholders have worked hard to consolidate properties so that we're not leasing properties out um, and paying outside uh, people rental properties. Um, so we brought a lot of the offices here into the county to reduce that cost. And that effort goes into trying to keep that um, budget, when it comes to the tax portion of it, as low as possible um, so that this way, you know, we have, if we have a tax increase, it's a minimal tax increase and we work very hard. There are areas that we don't control though. And one of those areas is that the, um, the state, when we have to uh, put somebody in a hospital uh, uh, for mental health. mental health issues, that used to be uh, paid for by the state. Uh, was it 100% at one time or, or close to? It's increased over $6 million over the last three years. So that's a cost that the county has to take on. And there's been a couple other spots in our in our county budget where the state has cut back on what they provided. And the county, to uh, continue those services, has had to pick up um, the cost, one of those being um, our family courts as a daycare for when the parents are in court. The judges have said that it's a good thing not to um, not to have the kids in the court. There's a daycare there that the kids go to while the parents are taking care of whatever issues they might have. The county has picked up the cost now uh, for, I believe, two-thirds of that program um, each year. Uh, that used to be covered by the state. Okay. Uh, my last question is where can people go f to find all the details of the budget, like every single detail regarding the budget? No, on the website. Our budget is on the website. On the county website? Yeah. And if you have any, any assistance, feel free to give my office a call. We will assist you in any way we can to provide you the information pertaining to the details of the 2017 budget, as well as previous year's budgets as well. All right. Thank you. Good evening once again. Uh, Charles Craddeville from New Brunswick. I'm the editor of New Brunswick Today, um, community newspaper here. I want to um, thank the, uh, the board for taking some first steps on both of the issues that uh, were uh, brought up at the last meeting, uh, you know, this uh, issue of um, uh, collaboration with ICE and uh, also the proposed pipeline. Um, that said, those are just first steps that you've taken. We've got a long way to go, and I hope that uh, we'll all follow through uh, on these important issues as we move forward. i got to say I am disappointed that we have another meeting here where I don't see the county sheriff or the county prosecutor. Um, joining us and I think quite frankly as I said last time the sheriff owes the public some explanations um, not just about this issue uh, but also about uh, scandals in her department it's been over a year now since I uh, exposed the issue with a warrant at her under sheriff's house uh, and uh, how that warrant was handled by the department and since then, haven't been able to get straight answers, haven't been able to get any type of response or accountability on that, and that does not inspire confidence. So uh, I, I do want to keep bringing that up until the answers are forthcoming. Um, I want to focus my questions on the... Uh, For your information, since the last meeting, you asked me if I would uh, speak to the sheriff, and which you had, just the other day, you had an opportunity that you were speaking to the sheriff at length. Did Three and a half minutes. Did you, did you ask her any of those questions? I did. You can watch and you can see that, you know, she didn't really get to answer them before she left. So, oh. um, still still waiting on the answers. And I have followed up with very polite emails and I'm not getting responses, so I'm kind of back to where I'm at, I was at. She's so. going to try to make this meeting. Okay. Well, I, I hope she can make the next one and, and I look forward to... Uh, um, uh, improve transparency. I do want to focus my questions on the, the ordinance that was on first reading tonight. I want to understand how much money is going to be spent on this uh, uh, purchase of office space for the county in the uh, cultural center project. Yes. I just got a thrill that Kenny mentioned earlier. One of the things that is consolidating 
all of our workforce into county-owned buildings. Uh, the intent is we will take ownership of uh, two floors at that facility, ownership, so we can move our cultural and arts uh, folks there, potentially our business development education folks there, to make sure it's an integral part of the whole uh, uh, arts and culture facility, along with the economic viability and growth requirements that we're trying to drive throughout Middlesex County. So the investment we're making there is directly related to having ownership on two floors to put our people there uh, for many years to come. What's the price tag? It's $12 million. $12 million. So it wasn't enough to give $6 million to this project. Now the county's shipping in another $12 million. So, so let me give you the financials, and I can give you the details if you'd like, even at a later time. But essentially, when you look at the cost of leasing space throughout Middlesex County, over a 20-year period, it's more effective to own our own facilities than to lease space and get no value to that. So when you look at the cost of six million, the $12 million, if you look at that same cost today, leasing space out over a 20-year period, it would cost us double that. So in essence, it is saving the taxpayers of Middlesex money, uh, uh, Middlesex County, approximately $12 million over a 20-year period by moving into our own facilities. Right. Well, and, and if I can, one of the other um, issues that we talked about was the recommendation in the beginning was one floor. Mm -hmm. And um, after some discussion, the, the core process was is that for the future of the county, uh, we don't know the future needs. Instead of uh, just limiting ourselves, we went a little bit above so that if we need to, there's space in the future for uh, the county or, or whatever programs they bring along during those days. Right, and, and, we'll, and in line with that, uh, where we are not going to use the space, we have the ability to lease that space out and use that money to fund uh, the day to day operations. Okay. Um, I just want to reiterate a concern. I know at the April 6th meeting you guys had a closed session where I presume you discussed this um, uh, uh, deal. And uh, I'm concerned that I, I believe you were represented in that meeting by uh, your county council, um, who also happens to be the lawyer for the developer and the property manager. And he's also involved with these arts organizations that you're dealing with. And uh, uh, it just does not seem uh, ethical for someone to be on both sides of the deal, the public side and the private side, and I think taxpayers who are concerned should make sure they come out to this uh, hearing on this ordinance um, uh, to see where another $12 million of your money is going to a uh, uh, politically connected developer here in New Brunswick. That's Thursday, May 18th at 7 p.m., and I hope that people will come and, and ask questions about this yes, expenditure because it's highly questionable. Thank you. State your name and address for the record, and you have five minutes. Junior Romero, 75 Baird Street, uh, New Brunswick, uh, with uh, Food and Water Watch and Environmental Nonprofit. Uh, members of the board, uh, Deputy Director and uh, Mr. Director. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, we uh, we had a good group of folks uh, talking about the Williams gas pipeline and the compressor station. And I wanted to thank uh, many of the members of the board uh, for individually signing up as interveners and as the board as a whole uh, choosing to intervene on, uh, on this issue uh, with the uh, appropriate federal uh, organization. Um, because of your actions, Somerset County uh, also followed suit only a few days later and signed up to intervene. Uh, just uh, to add a little bit, uh, although uh, Somerset County, uh, their, their intervention and their resolution was pretty much in opposition to the project uh, as a whole. Uh, and uh, I, I can only ask the, uh, the board and uh, Deputy Director, <laughs> Mr. Director, uh, to pass resolution uh, in opposition to this project. Uh, it would definitely um, uh, show, uh, it would be a symbol uh, to the cities like Sayreville and Old Bridge, uh, who really haven't been too receptive on this project, even though it's going uh, in their neighborhoods. And when I mean they haven't, I mean the politicians in that area, the members of the council. Uh, even Somerset County, which is a board I think is entirely Republican, uh, showed their outright opposition to this project. And uh, you know, this isn't a partisan issue, uh, but uh, I think uh, with our, our leadership here in the, in the county, uh, uh, the members of the board and the leadership on the board that have been great on, uh, on environmental issues and, uh, and con conserv conserving, ish uh, conserving energy issues, uh, then we can uh, pass a resolution here. And uh, I definitely hope that's something that, that is being considered. Uh, and uh, we are always uh, available for public input, uh, our input, our organization, and the members of the public uh, that, are, that are concerned about this issue. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and I have a couple of questions, um, as well as a statement. 
Uh, so my first question is, uh, has there a resolution been passed in the pipeline yet? Is there any plans of, of a resolution being passed on the pipeline? We have not passed a resolution on the pipeline issue. Okay. Uh, we filed as interveners, as many people asked us to do, and to make a, uh, for us to get the information from FER, uh, FERC. Uh, but we haven't made a decision uh, if we are going to uh, post a resolution. Isn't it correct that most people can f be interveners? Most, like people in, of not of public service, can be interveners. Like I myself can be an intervener. Most people in, here in the audience can be an interveners. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, what does that? How does that separate someone who is a freeholder versus just a regular person? Well, from what I understand, there were a couple of uh, individual interveners from the freeholder board that intervened. Am I correct in saying that? Okay. We, we did both as a freeholder board and, and as individuals. Okay. So it was done by both. Was it done specifically because there was a large objection or be, you had the actual, um, you know, fortitude to actually become, uh, to make, to become interveners? Because I feel like based on the last meeting and based a lot of, on a lot of people's last two weeks, obviously, um, that there was a lot of um, revolt and, you know, there was a lot of people who were very upset and that's, I feel like that's why freeholders specifically got involved and became interveners. Um, sure. Well, you want to say something? Sure. So, um, when Junior came here the first time, I think most of the residents that were with him, most of them, were from Somerset County. Mm -hmm. So, two weeks ago was the first time that residents from Middlesex County, a majority of residents from Middlesex County were here. So I took the information, that, me personally, that they provided. I, I looked into what they were requesting, um, and then I made my decision to uh, sign in as an intervener. Um, you know, we, we work for the, the residents of Middlesex County, and so when the county residents came here, I took their information and, and looked into it. Okay. okay. Um, but I know a lot of people who are, you know, very adamant about the pipelines, um, you know, considering the fact that the freeholders have had the information for over two weeks that they would have preferred uh, a much um, quicker um, turnaround as far as being an intervener and looking into the process. Uh, as I said, the first group of residents here and, and the majority of them were Somerset County. And if they had, the project is in Somerset County, the pipeline comes into our county, of course, but the compressor was in Somerset County. So when the residents of Middlesex County um, came here to voice their opinion, I listened and, and looked into it and, and moved forward. Um, and then my second one is just about the um, illegal immigration. Um, I know you have your policy when it comes to ICE and, and uh, not be able to uh, help out ICE specifically. Um, but how long does it take ICE to get that, um, that a judicial warrant when they need to uh, move forward? How long does that take them on average? I mean, I don't think there's a, there's a, a simple answer to that. They may already have a judicial warrant in their hands when they come. Uh, they may not even be able to get a judicial warrant. The point of our policy is, unless you have one, we are not going to be be detaining someone, nor are we going to honor some uh, uh, an ICE warrant uh, for arrest or for deportation unless it's accompanied by a judicial warrant. It, it's up to them to figure out whether they can get it or how long it's going to take them. Mm -hmm. But don't you feel you're kind of impeding the process considering ICE is a federal um, agency? So your point is that we should be cooperating with ICE? Yes. I mean, as, as long as they're not, you know, uh, specifically, you know, doing overstepping their authority or doing something from a legal matter that's illegal, you know, they, there is a reason that ICE is being enforced the way it is now under this current administration because, you know, in the last four to five years, about 30 percent of deaths concerning to, according to the Census Bureau, have been because of illegal immigrants. So that is why the current administration is really under the um, intensity that it's in in enforcing ICE. Do well, I, I, do, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I will just say this to you because I've been to several immigration forums. And here's the situation. If the federal government complies with the U.S. Constitution, then this board will do our duties to also comply. But the issue that has been happening is, is we are talking about civil employees making decisions that they do not have a legal right to make when it comes to the detention 
of human beings who are living in the United States and specifically in New Jersey. So the issue here is, is there is a mechanism under the law, which is to get a judicial warrant. One of the issues is, is these civil warrants have not been reviewed by anyone in the courts. That is not how we operate as an American criminal, uh, an American justice system, not criminal. Because some people are being picked up who don't actually, are, are not people who should be deported, but they are being deported, and they are being taken into custody, and some people were unlawfully taken into custody, and as a freeholder board, we have to take into account the fact that there have been many lawsuits filed all over the country where our U.S. federal courts have found that a town, a city, a county has been liable because they turned people over to ICE on civil administrative warrants. And the courts have found that that was unlawful on the part of those cities, towns, and counties. So this freeholder board is acting responsibly by following those precedents and saying if the federal government goes and gets judicial warrants, absolutely will comply because that is the law. Right. But my... That's time. That's time. I, I agree with you. I agree with you on that point, but my my argument is, you know, sometimes the government, specifically ICE, which is a federal agency, has information that's not accessible to, you know, say state or or county level or municipal level. So there are things that the federal government, as people know, like they're able to, um, you know private information and public information is very accessible. So there's always a war and there's always justifiable cause for ICE to be acting a certain way. Eventually, if they are into in blame, what ends up what does end up happening is, you know, they're gonna be able to have to release that person. It's not just they're gonna take them to custody and, and export them. Well sir, they are consistently. they are. They are exporting people. But where's your where's your evidence and of that? Because it's been happening, there have been lawsuits that have been brought and won by individuals who were taken into custody and deported and now have no ability to come back because of our federal immigration laws. So all I'm going to say about this is this isn't an arbitrary decision by this board. This is a decision by this board to comply with constitutional law. And that's what we're doing. Your time is up, sir. Okay. Thank um, you for your comments. Just, just, just one quick. No, uh, your time uh, is up. Okay. I, I just feel like you're not being fair to the rest of the people because some people have had more time than others. Just to say, just to clarify. I'm trying to comply with our policy as okay. best as I can. You Thank just you. Have to be fair with. I'm fair with everybody. Because Thank you. Linda State your name and address for the record, please. You have five minutes. Linda Powell, 22 Buffett Drive, Somerset, New Jersey. A um, couple things that are similar between uh, Middlesex County and Somerset County and a couple things that are not similar. Uh, we were told by our police chief and our assistant police chief at a town council meeting that they are following New Brunswick's policies on um, ICE and um, everything else. And when I was at the uh, May Day demonstration in, in New Brunswick, I spoke with a police officer and I asked him where I could find at the, about at the policies, and he was unaware of any policies, but he gave me the main number to call on the card. So he was trying to be helpful, but if the police are the ones who are doing the arresting, that are the, uh, my understanding is that the police pick up the people and then they're sent to the county jail, or whatever it's called. So if the police are not aware of the policy that is or don't even know whether or not a policy exists, I don't understand how they could, you know, everything could be smoothly. Yeah. We're not dictating policy to local law enforcement. No, I understand that, but there has to be some type of communication and consistency if they're the ones who are doing the arresting. We're Which not arresting anyone, ma'am. The only time we have uh, it may be an interaction with ICE is when after someone is arrested and they're incarcerated in our adult correctional facility. And then, of course, we comply the, to the policy that we have in place that was explained between our county council and our ward. All right, well, that comes to the next thing about people being targeted because um, a few weeks ago I was picked up, I was stopped by police in Franklin. 
um, because my license plate was deteriorating and they couldn't read the numbers. And when they were, when they figured it out and ran it, it ended up that I was overdue it, or paying my registration. I was not detained. I was not arrested. I went the next day and paid the registration and had to get new license plates. It just came to mind that when I first moved back from college and moved down to this area and took a job um, about 30 years ago, I was also arrested for not paying my registration because we didn't do this at, in Wisconsin. And um, I ended up getting a ticket, calling and finding out what I had to pay, and no one could help me about that. This was in Middlesex County. Now, if I had been living in New Brunswick, that means I could have been detained and possibly deported for a, a traffic violation 30 years ago, which to, in my mind is absolutely absurd. Of course, they'd have to deport me to Brooklyn, so it wouldn't you know, <laughs> been that bad. But, um, or maybe it would, I don't know. I haven't been there in a while. So that, that's another thing. I mean, people are being targeted and we know it. Um, the other thing that's different about Middlesex County and Somerset County, which kind of surprised me, because I always thought that Franklin should really be part of Middlesex County um, because of our politics there, was that the Somerset County freeholders also intervened. But they intervened in opposition because they, they basically said that it was their responsibility is for the health and safety of the Somerset County residents. And quite frankly, we're not convinced of the need for the facility, which is a compressor station, that it outweighs the concerns. Um, and basically, they, they did not feel that Transco could mitigate any substantial adverse environmental and social impacts. And, um, you know, the, the pipelines in Pennsylvania that were supposed to not even have to be expected for five years exploded a year ago. And the same type of thing. The so pipelines that are downwind of compressor stations are corroding, which I think was explained at the last meeting. The increase in velocity, um, all these different chemicals that are in there, the increase in t which increases the temperature, which then increases the chemical reactions, and these pipelines are corroding at you know just rates that no one ever would have expected that was within a year of being inspected. These pipelines are all going under Middlesex County, and you don't know whether they're by your house or not. So I really would consider a, um, having some type of re resolution in opposition to this project. This gas is not for New Jersey. We don't need it, and we don't want it. My name is Kathy Scarborough. I live at 59 Tallux Drive in East Brunswick. Um, regarding the policy about ICE, one thing that I haven't heard yet that I'm concerned about. Um, as, you, as is clear, when people come in contact with the county um, judicial system in any way, the kind of personal information that is collected is very important and can lead to ramifications with ICE. So I'm wondering if this new policy addresses the kind of personal information that's collected on residents that you come in contact with and whether it directs the, the um, jails and um, other county personnel to be conservative in that kind of personal information you're collecting on residents. Tom. I'm not sure what you mean by residents, but our, our contact really is very simple. The only contact we have is if someone ends up in the adult correction center for a reason, whether it's a minor offense or a major offense, and we're, they're being held in lieu of bail or, or other means of being able to be released. And information is, is, is as re mandated by law, that is taken from those individuals and put into a database. And that's all that's done. They're not doing the arresting or, or singling out people. Right. So and in the court, excuse me, in, in the courthouse, it's the same situation. The, the sheriff's department is only there providing security and maintaining control. Uh, and they may, be, they may be transporting someone who's in custody right. from the adult correction center there. Right. So they're not, they, so getting information and where it's being maintained is, is strictly a uh, procedure that's mandated by law as someone is brought into the corrections facility. And we're not going beyond what's required by law? No, 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 no. Okay, thank no. you. Yeah. 
Anna Perez, 344 Baker Street in Highland Park. Um, uh, thank you for your effort to um, clarify your uh, detention policies, and thank you for your time listening to the people and for your crystal clear explanations. I think this is very reassuring to everybody who is here to hear that you are being so responsible and responsive. Now the problem, not everybody's here. We have some emissaries from the community and from what you heard, there's a level of fear that's incredible. So um, it's very, it's excellent to, um, uh, it's to, to, to tighten policies, but we need to make an effort to uh, possibly um, adopt a more comprehensive policy, a more explanatory policy that tells people what their rights are, um, because they do not know, you know. Um, even the detention policy is hard to read. So I think an effort of, um, a po efforts of drawing more policy language that accompanies, that um, amplifies what you try to do, what you did with the detention policy would be uh, first very just would uh, clarify things. I think clarification is very important. I hear uh, all the time uh, Middlesex is a sanctuary county on the basis of non co no town enter the 287G agreements. I don't think that makes it the sanctuary county. So I think if there's that very widespread misperception in the public and I've, I've seen when people approach uh, um, towns about uh, uh, passing policies they often get this response to just kind of placate and oh no but you know we're a sanctuary county I think it's your responsibility to clarify what and when and how are we possibly a sanctuary county? And so there's, there needs to be a work of explaining and explaining to the community and explaining to officials so they don't, you know, um, um, unwillingly convey information that might not be fully accurate. Um, I also wanted to bring up to your attention a case which is not directly relevant to the discussion of uh, detention policy, but it is about undocumented people and their fear, their anxiety, uh, how um, uh, helpless they feel. Uh, this is Karim Erandujar. She's uh, the founder, she's a Rutgers student, the founder of Undocu Rutgers, which is an organization uh, that has had a lot of impact on um, university practices and, and policies. The president of Rutgers University came out and expressed his commitment to protect the rights and privacy of all students. Now, of course, this is not, this is nothing if the towns and the <coughs> counties where these students live um, don't themselves clarify their policies. So I want you to make an effort to go beyond words and make an effort to reach out to the communities. Uh, and just to explain, maybe explain also your limitations, what you can do and what you cannot do, and uh, it just try to help the people that are so in need. Uh, I just thought that Karima is facing um, uh, detention and possibly deportation. Her DACA status expired two days ago, and she has to go on Tuesday before um, deportation officer, 9, 9 a.m., at Newark, we don't know what will happen, but this is a high-profile case, and it will bring questions. The media will ask questions. I think it's very important at those critical moments that elected officials have answers to those questions and can perhaps adopt a stance, uh, not necessarily a political statement, but just at least, um, at least provide the public with the questions that they're so much in, in need of the answers. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. Motion to close public portion. Second. Motion to close by Fielder Kenny, seconded by Deputy Director Tamara. All in favor? Opposed. Motion carries. There a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion by Fielder Valente, seconded by Deputy Director Tamara. All in favor? Opposed. Motion carries.